but I'm going to go ahead and talk about the, the Niger coup because it's extremely important. Um, and I'll go ahead and start. So, uh, Jamie, if we can just start with, uh, you can play the video it's, and I'll uh, go ahead and read through the, the tweet. So, um, the French embassy, this is a French embassy in the capital of Niger, and it was surrounded by supporters of the coup. And you can see the African flags, um, not the Af the Russian flags in uh, the crowd. OK, so again, we saw this a little bit in Peru when people were opposing the current government there that was forced on them. Now we're seeing uh, this in Niger and people were chanting long live Russia, long live Putin and down with France, down with Macron. Now, Macron isn't a very popular figure at all right now in France, let alone here in Niger. He's clearly not popular in Burkina Faso, and he's clearly not popular anywhere in the uh, previous former colonies of France that, according to the people of these countries like Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and um, so several countries in this, in this vicinity that have been conquered and colonialized by France, they the, the colonialism never stopped it never changed it just shifted into this neo-colonialism and they basically decided that they want to oust the uh the the current government because the current government was too western influenced and they needed to get rid of it and i'm just gonna go over the article um uh jamie if you want to put it up i'm gonna go over a couple things on this article so this uh niger uh coup leader he declared himself the president okay and he uh he was the head of the presidential guard and he's been just declared as president and uh he masterminded the overthrow of the former president mohammed bazoum and um he's also known as omar tichani um, and he appeared on this state TV channel, calling himself the president of the newly formed military council, the national council for the homeland. And he said this coup was to protect national security. And um, the former president was detained early on Wednesday by members of his security detail with uh, top military officials saying he was removed from power and that all the institutions were suspended. So clearly the military was involved in this. This was a organized, well-organized and executed coup. And so Macron and the EU are, are having like a breakdown. Macron had described this guy as a courageous leader who is making reforms and investments that the country needed. Um, and Paris, of course, is going to support regional powers and imposing sanctions on these coup plotters. And um, so that that is essentially it. And um, he the, the he criticized uh, the former president was critical of the cooperation between Mali and Burkina Faso with with certain of these junchas that were trying to overthrow the government. This is important to note because as we just noted, um, Burkina Faso is a very, has a very anti-West president, a president that, that really wants to break the chains, literally, of any sort of Western hegemony, any sort of Western influence, and they want to get rid of these foreign interventionists. And so the European Union, the United States has denounced this coup Russia, it's an interesting thing with Russia because Russia pretty much follows the UN uh, diplomatic charter. They basically do things like very properly. So while the while Sergey Lavrov has said we don't, you know, support a non-democratic way of taking over the government, um, in other in other aspects, uh, Russia is clearly showing support in a very diplomatic way for the nations that are trying to oust um, these, you know, foreign interventions, French, United States, and so on and so forth, NATO uh, states, NATO countries. And so on one end, the United States is is uh, able to say, oh, you know, even Russia is, is calling this, uh, you know, is denouncing this, but Russia isn't really denouncing it. They, in a way, they they say, oh, well, we're, you know, we're not, we're not for this. We're not for this happening in this way. We want to respect these institutions and blah, blah, blah. Because uh, unlike popular belief, Russia is a very diplomatic 
uh, country. This is why, you know, in spite of everything Ukraine and the United States has done, they have at every turn tried to seek peace and negotiations, almost to the anger of several people within the Russian uh, population that want more of a um, retaliatory uh, policy, uh, but they they will always seek diplomacy first. And so they're not going to embrace and say, yeah, we're going to back the coup uh, plotters, but they, in a way, they this is exactly what they're doing in terms of diplomacy with other nations that are supportive of Niger's coup. So it's kind of a complicated situation, but um, Sergei Lavrov did criticize it as unconstitutional. Um, and a lot of people were mad about that, but I'm not surprised because this is this is how Russia is. This is how they act all the time. Like they're never going to be. Uh, they're not like this super revolutionary type of country. They have revolutionary type of people and sentiments, mostly in the Donbass and in other parts of Russia, not in Moscow itself. And when it comes to that, you know, the government is uh, somewhat divided. Now, uh, I do want to show the this other update on basically what happened. You can show that while I talk. Uh, so basically what happened was the um, the African Union, which uh, was mentioned by Ibrahim Traore, right? He said the African Union should support African leaders who want to get rid of these uh, Western-backed uh, governments. Well, the African Union issued an ultimatum for the Niger coup leaders and um, obviously threatening with sanctions, but it's not working. They're not going to relinquish power. And um, this was a statement by the African Union alarming. Uh, they condemned the alarming resurgence of coups and the bloc called for on the soldiers who ousted Bazoom to return immediately and unconditionally to their barracks and restore constitutional authority within a maximum of 15 days. Uh, should the military refuse to comply, the council said it would take necessary action, including punitive measures against the perpetrators. So again, so it doesn't seem like that's happening. The U.S. has said that they're going to renounce any sort of aid to Niger. But Niger, uh, the leadership, the, the current president, said that the United States might want to keep its money and use it to help its own homeless population. This is what they said. Uh, they don't want it. They don't need it. So what we're seeing here perhaps is um, the beginning of I wouldn't say it's the beginning because Burkina Faso pretty started much started it, but this is now just like I guess a continuation of this ousting of foreign leadership of intervention. And I think what's most important about this is the timing. It's happening right now on the eve, of course, during the whole Russia Africa summit um, when it it was taking place, um, and then it's also happening. Uh, at a time when we're talking about multipolarity, Pan-Africanism, when we see Libya, Burkina Faso, Mali, and other parts of, of Africa basically try to stop any sort of other foreign intervention. This is, uh, the timing is perfect to do it, especially when we're talking about what Russia is doing. And this is what I said a long time ago. I said, what Russia is doing and fighting NATO, because we know this is a proxy war of Russia versus NATO, has pretty much unleashed a domino effect when it comes to Arab countries, when it comes to countries in Africa, when it comes to countries in Latin America. And so what we're seeing is this trend of, it, I mean, it's a good trend, but it is in a way a trend where countries are seeing what Russia was able to do and seeing what China is doing and saying, and what BRICS is doing, and they want to join BRICS. They want to find ways of divesting from the dollar and transferring into a new monetary system away from SWIFT. And they want a, a way to have their own economies built up and to cooperate with everybody, especially their neighbors in Africa, whether in Latin America. And this is why this is a real thing that's happening now in terms of, you know, how fast it's going to happen. It's, I don't think we're going to see the dollar sink tomorrow. I think this is going to take a long time. But what what is happening in Africa right now is an opportunity for Africa to really, once and for all, free itself. And are we going to see retaliation from the United States? Absolutely. We're going to see them do everything they can to stop this. But this coup 
is essentially a strong statement of of what that is. And another important point of this whole entire uh, coup in Niger is what it's going to do to France. Now, France, of course, post pandemic, right, and what they did there. And then the billions and millions of dollars going to Ukraine has not helped Europe in general, especially Germany, but also France. We've seen the protests for months, uh, you know, against NATO, against the uh, money being given to Ukraine. We've seen that uh, Macron is not a popular figure. But now add this into the, the, the recipe and then you get disaster because this is what it is. Now, this is a tweet from Going Underground, if you can put that one up. Um, and this is what they said, and this is accurate. Niger fights back against French domination. The new military regime has signed a decree banning the export of gold and uranium to France. The toppled government, which was a close ally of France, has given permission to strike Niger to free its toppled president. One in three light bulbs in France are powered by uranium from Niger and provided the EU with 25% of its uranium, while France and the EU dominated Niger with neocolonial exploitation. 80% of Niger citizens have no access to electricity and 80% live on less than $2 a day. Will France says militarily attack Niger to restore neocolonial domination on one of the poorest countries in the world? Um, I wouldn't put it past them, but that's what I wanna point out here, okay? And this is what it says in French, long live uh, Niger, live long live uh, Russia. Um, and so this is this is what I want to point out here. This is the whole sentiment that was echoed in the Russia Africa summit. Why are African countries that export all of this, all of these natural resources and have all of this wealth via the, their natural resources literally don't see any money of it. And not only that, in Niger's case, 80% of their population doesn't have electricity, but they're literally responsible for maintaining electricity in the French population. What would happen if we were to turn the tables and take away that free, basically, right? That the exploitation that they've been, that France has been putting on Niger as one of the countries, it's not the only one, but it, what would happen to the French? What would they do? Perhaps the French need to find out, need to really understand this here. And, and you know, they're already angry at Macron. I don't think this is going to help. And I think, you know, France is obviously well-versed in revolution. But I think what we're seeing here, too, is a revolution in Africa. And a revolution doesn't come necessarily in the form that we all have romanticized um, on, you know, with, like, just chopping heads off and everything else. It, it's coming in the forms of just literally breaking away the last remaining chains that these European countries have on Africa. And again, Kevork also uh, reiterated these same points, right? Like 80% of the people in Niger don't have electricity, but somehow they power the French. And and so these pro-Russian coup, coup, coup leaders, as you can see from the Russian flags, uh, they decided they were gonna stop the export. This is how you, this is how you make change. They know that the power lies in them because they have these resources and they're using those, this, stopping those resources to, to really just say, okay, you're not getting this for free. You're not going to continue exploiting, uh, exploiting us. You're not going to continue doing this. And so France threatened them, of course, the United States threatened them. And he said, he took it this way. He said, count to 10 until ISIS miraculously appears in Niger. Because if you follow the playbook, they're, the United States and NATO need to have something to vilify these people for right oh these are just crazy destructive radical you know factions oh we're gonna tie them to isis this is what always happens it's what it's not surprising but the reality is these are simply people who are sick and tired of being exploited by the west by the united states and nato and they didn't go and fight freedom for their countries to then be colonized again via neocolonialism by Europe and slaving away, literally. So French, the French could have electricity, but so their own people couldn't have electricity. I don't see anything wrong with them doing that. And if that's what the majority of people of Niger want to do, then by all means, they, sh they should do it. 
But of course, the United States isn't going to just simply allow that uh, to happen. And so I, it, what's going on in Niger is extremely important. You should continue to watch it because it's, it's really, I, I think it's contagious what's been happening, what Burkina Faso started and what others have been doing. Um, but it, it's essential, um, essentially, I think we're going to be seeing more of this because a lot of people in Africa are sick and tired of their continent being the poorest continent when they have the most resources. Um, and the last one I want to read, uh, Jamie, is the last tweet on this section uh, by D&D Politics. Um, and because the other one we already pretty much said. So the, uh, the, the government of Niger says France is planning uh, strikes to free Bazoom. The Niger military junta that seized power last week and ousted President Mohamed Bazoum said on Monday that the toppled government had authorized France to carry out strikes at the presidency to try and free Bazoum. So why would why would a government of Niger authorize France to carry out strikes? So I guess you're not a free government then, which is why these people are trying to regain uh, control of their government, right? The military regime, which has confined Bazoum to the presidential palace since Wednesday, has previously warned against foreign attempts to extract him, saying it would result in bloodshed and chaos. Supporters of the junta burned French flags and attacked the French embassy in Niger's capital, Niime, on Sunday, drawing tear gas from police. The junta accused France in another statement of shooting at protesters, injuring six. And you can see these pictures of what is going on. Um, Africa right now is where the eyes of the world are, um, not just from the Russia-Africa summit, but from the, the leadership and the really the, the, the revolutionary sentiment that is happening over there. And for too long, people have ignored Africa. Um, even in our coverage, it's just, there was never enough Africa, uh, coverage. And now, um, I see gladly more and more media covering what's going on in Africa. And Africa, of course, has always been uh, a continent with many countries that have been in solidarity with the revolution of Latin America, the revolutions of any country trying to maintain their national sovereignty, their their ability to make their own decisions. And that's all that it is. When, when we talk about revolution, that's all that it is. When I think revolution has been maligned as a word and it's also been uh, just romanticized by these dumb, western liberals as something cool as something you know that is just whatever you know like the bernie sanders movement also did a lot to really hurt that term because bernie sanders literally she herded people into the democratic party and there was no revolution and so when you think when you hear that word in the west it's like all oh, these you know dumb you know bernie sanders and all of these you know libs wanting a revolution that's not what we're talking about here we're talking about people who don't have access to electricity, people who don't have uh, the national sovereignty that they deserve to decide what want they want in their own countries. We're talking about people who need education and roads, basic human needs. And all of these peoples of the global South who have fought for that for so long, it seems to be this re-emerging trend. And it's not just, of course, in Africa, we also saw it in Latin America, and we're seeing it, of course, we're seeing this fight, right, between AFRICOM and, and Africa I'm trying to, to take over. And again, showing this map, it's it's really clear what we've pretty much done to Africa this whole time is exploited it for its gold, its natural gas, its iron, its cotton, its, its oil, um, and coffee, as was mentioned by uh, Uganda, and all of these resources. But really, none of these countries get any of it. And when we talk about lithium, that's another one that's in Latin America and Bolivia. And this is why Peru was, of course, cooed uh, because of that lithium. And lithium is the mineral for the future, for the fourth industrial revolution. So that, that you're going to be seeing a really big fight. And the Russia-Ukraine-NATO uh, proxy war is only one facet of it. It's only one facet of it because, again, when it comes to imperialism, it's all about fighting for natural resources and and exploiting those resources so that's that's what it's about it's not even about ideology at this point it's about getting the most natural resources that you can get so